morning and welcome to worship on this Mothering Sunday. I'm recording this at the Stenneth Priory, the mother church for our area in Forfar in years gone by. Thinking about how God loves his church, how God loves his church like a mother to us, where God is father. We're going to think about love. We're going to think about what it means to be saved. And we're going to join together in praise. But we start our time in prayer, so please join me in prayer. Living, loving, ever present God, you journey with your people through every time and season. You remain faithful, dependable and true. When we look to you, often we are unable to see the way ahead, for you make the darkness light and turn sorrow into joy. God of all the universe, you draw alongside us, weeping with us, gently cradling our pain, reaching out to heal and to hold. Forgive us, O God, when we forget your love for ourselves and for others. Forgive us when we hoard or discard resources out of the rich bounty that you have given. Forgive us when we fail to see our connectedness to you and to our neighbour. Bring us back to you time after time. Stop us in our tracks. Confound us with love until, worn down, we fix our eyes on you, God of our salvation. On this Mothering Sunday, be with all who find this day hard and all who rejoice, holding them in your love, which surpasses all love that we can ever know. Amen. The Church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. We sing together.
Our reading this week is by my mum, Barbara Chalmers, from Strathmartin Parish Church, who've been joining us these last few weeks in our services. We hear together from Numbers and from the Gospel according to John. Our reading from the uh, Bible is from Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go round the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to the, to the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people. And they bit the people so that many Israelites died. People came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord, take away the serpents from us. I've come in out of the wind. It's blowing a hoolie out there. I actually recorded most of this outside at the church and in the park today, but you couldn't hear anything because of the wind. So I apologize, I've come back inside, it's a bit cozier in here. I was thinking about the numbers passage because it's not the easiest one to make sense of why God sends snakes, but here's what my friend Marcella Glass has to say about it. She says that the numbers reading is about God's people complaining again. Now. We looked at God's people complaining in the desert and their wilderness wanderings over our late summer and autumn period. They complained that there was no water, they complained there was no food, they complained about being thirsty, they complained about the food they had, they complained about invading Canaan, they just kept complaining. They're a bit like those people who leave one star reviews on TripAdvisor for places they've gone to not because they're bad places, but because it wasn't what they were expecting. I saw one that gave the Arthur Seat Hill in Edinburgh one star review because there was no cafe and no seats. It's a hill. What were they expecting? Another that said the Museum of Piping should only get one stars because they only played bagpipe music. Well, don't you expect that in a bagpipe museum? Anyway, our people of Israel were complaining again. God was used to hearing them complaining, but this was slightly different because this time they started to complain against God. They started to complain against the Lord that brought them out of Egypt and they lost trust in God. They lost the trust that they had in God's promise that he would lead them to the promised land. And therein lies the problem. Because they appear to have gone too far, too far even for the most gracious God who is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. This time, because they complain against God and because they lose trust in him, God allows the snakes that had previously not been in the camp to suddenly be where they are living. Now, whether God sent actual snakes or whether it was that God sent them by a way that brought them into the territory of snakes for the first time, we don't really know. But we know that for the first time in their wilderness wanderings, they come against snakes being where they're living. Snakes that kill. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of snakes, and I certainly wouldn't want them where I was camping. And that's okay because you should be scared of snakes, a little bit at least. And the story should be scary. It's not a coincidence that God uses the animal that scares us most to work out this issue for the Hebrews. Who, faced with snakes, repent, asking him to intercede on their behalf to God against whom they had sinned, returning to God, trusting in God again. 
They believed again in the promises of life. Just as the snake was raised onto a pole and offered them salvation or the chance to be saved, they could see God's promise lifted up. The people of the Hebrews trust God again. The killer serpents led the people to repentance. God hears Moses on treaties on behalf of the people and he commands Moses to make a poisonous serpent, set it on a pole, and then everyone who's bitten shall look at it and live. Moses obeys God and makes a bronze serpent and puts it on a pole. And whenever a servant bits someone, the person would look on the servant, serpent of bronze and live. God didn't get rid of the snakes. The dangers of the world were still there. But he took a symbol of fear and death and turned it into a symbol of life. Our New Testament reading is taken from John chapter 3, verses 4 to 17. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Thanks be to God. Marcella Glass continues her questioning and her wondering when she looks towards John's Gospel, where the connection is made between Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness to bring life from death to the person of Jesus who is lifted on a cross to bring eternal life from death. I just want to make sure that we understand that Moses wasn't thinking about Jesus as he did this. He's thinking about the people of God. Hebrew people don't need to see Jesus in their story in order to interpret it. We as Christians can use their story to help make sense of ours. And one of them is being lifted up. What in this passage does it mean to be lifted up? Well, Jesus often is referred to as the son of man being lifted up. And on one level, he is talking about the cross event of literally being lifted up onto a cross. On another, it means being lifted up, being exalted, being given that boost, a sign of God's glory, of death being turned to life. And there's also a sense of being lifted up to heaven, particularly in this passage from John, where Jesus is talking late at night with a man called Nicodemus, who's come to him in the darkness to ask questions about life everlasting. And he talks about Jesus coming down from heaven. And then there's also this part about being lifted back up. Just as the Hebrew people can't be saved from the danger of snakes, remember, God doesn't take the snakes away. So we too cannot be saved by just the experience of the cross, because there is no exaltation without the crucifixion in John's Gospel. Just as the Hebrew people can't be saved from the danger of the snakes, remember God doesn't take the snakes away, so we too cannot be saved without the experience of the cross, because there is no exaltation without the crucifixion in John's Gospel. There is no Easter morning without Good Friday. So the passage in Numbers is brought in to reinforce to John's community how God in the past had lifted something up to bring life to God's people so that they can realise the healing power of God in the lifting up of Christ. Whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. John's gospel, and this part, passage in particular, is often used to argue that we need to choose Jesus. And that is part of it. 
But our response is about the grace that saves us. It doesn't diminish the gift. Because the exaltation of Christ in the cross is something that turns the glory of resurrection. And it's not just being reduced to something that we own or chose. God so loved the world, not just us, but the world. If we leave it to God to figure out how the saving works, if we leave it to God to do the judgment and Christ to do the salvation, that's the right way. All we are called to do is believe. And yet, as believers, we're often ready to make a creation of a community from that, where God's love is lifted up. And that's a good thing. When we come together as a church, whether as a home group or a parish church or a mission, and we start to raise God and we start to lift up Christ's name in our behaviour, people should see it. But what are we lifting up? We need to ask ourselves. Because as much as we love gathering together, as much as we cannot wait to all be back in our buildings, we're not a social club. As much as we love serving our community, as much as we love doing for others, we are not a social work department. We are a people of God. We are called to give people a glimpse of God's kingdom lifted up for the community to see. As we slowly make plans to return to in-person events and community, can we be intentional about how we return and about what and how we lift up to the community and for each other? Amen. We sing together, I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. is my home church or mother church, South Martin Parish Church in Dundee. These are the stained glass windows that I would look at as a little girl. There's the font that I was baptised in and the banner that I helped to sew as a teenager. Here's a photo of some of the members of the guild. Many Kent faces for me there. People who nurtured me, cared for me, supported me and brought me up in faith. I wonder who the parents in your faith were, who the mothers in the church were that looked out for you, encouraged you and supported you over the years. For many of us, this is Mother Church, the place 
where we meet our church family. Hopefully it won't be long until we can gather here again. Kirk Session is meeting this coming week to look at when and how we open our building for the 50 people that we're allowed to have in at the moment. But please pray for us and continue to pray for the day when all of us can gather together safely and be church for one another. God loved the world so much that he promised to save us from the worst of our fears, from snakes in our homes. He sent his son to be raised up so that whoever believes in him might have eternal life. And he sent church families to care for us, to love us, support us and help us grow in faith through the years, wherever we may be. Today, our prayers for others are led by one of the church family. She's very special to me. I call her my forfer mum because she mothers me a lot. It's Session Clark, Maureen Fenton. Gracious God, you know what it is to love your children, to watch over them tenderly, anxiously, proudly, and constantly. You know what this means, for you have called us your children, and you care for each of us as deeply as a mother cares for her child. So now we pray for those entrusted with the responsibility of motherhood, for those who watch over their children in the same way and with the same feelings and intensity that you do. Grant to each one your wisdom, guidance and strength. Lord of love, hear our prayer. We pray especially for single mothers, those faced with the challenge of raising a child or children on their own, with no one else to share the demands and joys of parenthood. We pray for those who have always wanted to be a mother, but for them that dream was never realised. We pray for those who have lost their mothers or never known them, those whose mothers have died and for whom this day brings pain rather than pleasure. Grant them your comfort, support and assurance of your love always with them. Lord of love, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are separated from their children, those who have suffered a miscarriage or been through an abortion, those who have endured the agony of a child's death. Give to them your help, your solace and hope for the future. Lord of love, hear our prayer. And in the present hard times, we pray for all the mothers that work on the front line, whether in the NHS, shop workers, post office workers, delivery workers, teachers and so many more, as they continue doing their job, worried that they might take the virus home to their own families. You understand what mothers face, what they give, what they feel. Accept our thanks for them all this day and grant them all your special blessing. Lord of love, hear our prayer, and hear us now as we all say together the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. We sing together, You Raise Me Up. We're going to sing along to a video with words. So I hope you can enjoy the music as well as singing along.
I am down, and oh, my soul so weary. When troubles come, and my heart burden be, then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come. And sit a while with me. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shore. Thank you for joining me for worship. It's been so good to see you. I hope this Mothering Sunday you know the love of your church family and how much we're looking forward to being together again. We'll see you very soon. In the meantime, stay safe and stay well. Stay in the love of God and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen.